In today's podcast, Nicholas Brown, Compass Real Estate, Atlanta, Georgia. He's a top agent and I connected with him several weeks ago. He is um, very, very interesting. He got into the business originally in hotel management, working with the Ritz Carlton Hotel brand. How he got into luxury real estate, it was about 14 years ago. Listen to his journey, you're really gonna like this, and his future plans of expanding his business. Nicholas Brown, how are you, brother? How are you? Very good, good, how are you? Excellent, excellent. Are you in Atlanta right now? Yes, yeah, in Atlanta. Yeah, it's the season, so we're definitely in Atlanta right now. Excellent. So right now it's June. This is the start of like a busy season for you, typically? No, it's not the start of busy season. This is what, this is almost like this sort of the midpoint crescendo. We actually really tend to fall off a cliff face for July and August, so we... You know, people like to call it the spring market here, but we really run from January 15th to June 30th. Then July is very quiet and it's the South, you know, it's hot, everyone's at the beach, school is out. So it, it, those are never our best months for selling. Yeah, they, by, your, by way of your accent, it doesn't sound like you're from Atlanta. Where are you from? Born and raised in Lower Alabama. No, I... Uh, I hail from the United Kingdom, um, although I have, uh, my father was in the oil business, so I've been very fortunate to live in many countries, many continents, so I grew up, I was born in the UK, I finished the latter part of my schooling in the university in the UK, but I lived in Malta in the Mediterranean, I grew up partially in Singapore, actually this will be the fourth time I've lived in the United States uh, throughout my entire life, we, we, we lived a short period of time in Miami, uh, back back in the 80s when it was uh, the height of the drug war, so that didn't last too long with my mother. Uh, but yeah, so my accent's sort of convoluted, but I, I've got a lot of rich travel underneath my belt. So of the different places that you lived around the world growing up, how do you how would you say that's prepared you for the current business that you're involved in in the real estate industry? It's a good question, I, I think, and I'll answer that in twofold because, um, you know, one of the reasons that I uh, wanted to get back to the United States um, when I was at university, um, I chose a course specifically in hotel catering and institutional management. And the reason I did that is because they had a gap year that allowed me to go and work for the Ritz-Carlton Chicago and the Ritz-Carlton Amelia Island. And um, that was a big, big factor in my world, you know, real estate is fairly new in, in, on the horizon, although I'm getting a little longer in the tooth. This will be year 14. Um, I got into residential real estate um, out of necessity back in the 08, 09 market crash. So I think I'll answer it two ways. The years of hospitality experience that I had and the luxury management training that I received from brands like Ritz-Carlton and other boutique hotel chains throughout Europe and Asia um, really prepared me for, um, I think, real estate, a lot of transferable skills, a lot of things learned, as particularly from the relationship and the service aspect. As far as living um, in those different countries, I mean, look, I would tell you, I, I have children of my own. I think travel and foreign travel, and I'm not talking about going down to Mexico to an all-inclusive, really getting into travel, whether it be South America, Europe, Asia, um, those those really bring cultural diversification and let you know that there is a world outside of the United States and that, that there, there is a lot of things that evolve. So I think it brings maturity and I think it brings understanding and I think it allows me to speak to people of all races, all cultures and all works as well. So I think, yeah, I think it's added a lot from both of those perspectives. Did, did you get involved in the hotel management business out of university? How did you get involved uh, in I that? Did. I did. My course was hotel catering and institutional management. And I worked for the Ritz Carlton. And then when I went back to the UK, I walked right into hotel management. That's exactly what happened. And how many years were you doing that? Oh, so I, my first job was in a sandwich store at 13 years old, which is actually illegal in the United Kingdom. And I went, I was in hospitality all the way through until I was 29 years old. Okay, so. And I'm, I'm, I'm 40, 48 now for reference. Okay. 
and you transitioned from hotel management into real estate in 2008, some would say that wasn't a very good idea because the market was in the doldrums, just really bad, hard to break into the industry, not as many transactions. What prompted you to get into real estate? Well, actually, we're slightly off there. When I moved back and got married um, back in 2004, um, I had already made a determination. I'd already moved out of hospitality. Actually, I'd moved. I was living in Bangkok, Thailand. I was working for a marketing company there. Then I had to go back to the UK to get my visa before coming to the United States in 2004. Um, I knew that I did not want to venture back into hospitality, um, and I. But I, I got aligned with a company that was actually bizarrely, and I don't know how this really truly happened, but it was a land development, very large land development company called Land Resource. And we um, built and developed second home communities up and up and through the East Coast, from West Virginia down to Florida. So we were building things like HGTV dream homes, and then we were at the top of a mountain in, in Asheville. We were at a seafront in St. Mary's, Georgia, or we were down Cumberland Island. We were absolutely everywhere. And at that time, I wasn't involved in the sales. I was specifically involved in the marketing and the event, the weekend events. And there were, my budget was three and a half million. And we had helicopters and cars and boats and, you know, party tricks and ice carvings. And it was just, it was a, it was a lot of fun and money was free flowing. And then that company, Land Resource, moved to Orlando. So I decided to open up our own event marketing company with five friends. And that business went down. Coincidentally, I was in New York the day that Lehman Brothers crashed. My brother was getting married. He'd come over from Dubai. And I was like, what are all these media vehicles? And we were literally around the corner from the Lehman offices and that crash. Well, I found myself gainfully unemployed um, and a fresh off the boat, an immigrant claiming social security. My father was helping me pay my mortgage and I didn't have any other option. I was sending out resume after resume after resume, and I have a good international resume. I couldn't get a job, Nick. I couldn't, nobody would talk to me. And I literally had a magnet put on the side of my mailbox one day, and it was a Keller Williams agent. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to call this person and see what real estate is about. And the next thing you know, I was in real estate school. I got my real estate license. I made a really, really good decision. I was about where I ended up landing with my license, which fortunately worked out very well. And so, yes, it was extremely difficult to walk into that. And in 2009 was when I walked in very hard. I had no other option. My back was against the wall. So I fought, I scrapped. And I, you know, let's just say it was a good incubation period for me to learning and how to become a counselor, but also learn about short sales, foreclosures. And so... You know, it was absolutely out of necessity that I got into real estate, but and and I would tell you that I, I probably would never have said I would move into a commission only position if I hadn't been forced into it. And it turns out it was the best thing that ever happened. Wow, that's amazing! It's uh, a lot of um, grit, I'm sure you developed in those years of losing everything, getting into a new industry, uh, foreign country, and. Um, Real estate, a lot of people in the past four years have seen it as a glamorous and very easy industry to make money. But the harsh reality is that's not the way it always is. And I think it would be interesting to know in the last year, have you seen a change in your real estate market? And has it been shifting like what we've been hearing in a lot of different markets? Yes. Um, I mean, the, 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 the two to three years prior were just absolutely fantastic and phenomenal. Still a lot of hard work and we're in a very challenged inventory market like a lot of the other markets around the country. Um, and we didn't see quite that we saw frenetic increase in pricing, but not quite like some of the other markets. So um, ultimately, this year has been really choppy. Um, I, I can't make the head and the tail of it. Some deals happen very quickly. Other deals don't happen at all. There's a lot of attrition. There's a lot of, uh, you know, calls from our buyers. And then some sellers are just not realistic to, to what is current pricing. Interest rates are having a, a, a very significant impact. So it's just really choppy out there right now. Um, we're still holding our own. We're still grinding it out, as you would expect, but it is certainly not what it was. And then obviously we've got, you know, other headwinds coming in July and, you know, we've got an election at the end of the year. So 
I think this year really needs to sort of work itself out and hopefully we roll into 2025 with a little bit more clarity because I just don't think it's there. I think a lot of people feel are in purgatory with rates or, or wherever where, or an inventory. So I'm, I'm hoping we see better clarity as we move into the end and, and into the beginning of the new year. Where do you see the real estate market in Atlanta being over the next two to three years? I mean, you're going through a little bit of a, a lull in the market, but do you see anything changing after the U.S. election? I think what I found in the past two elections that I've been involved in and that it always creates a little bit of a pause for people. You know, everyone wants to know where the country's going. What is the administration doing? How is it going to impact the economy? Um, interestingly, I don't know that anyone is really truly as impacted as they might think that they are, but they the, certainly the higher net worth individuals um, that we work with, they do, do they do pause. You know, what I think we're suffering from more right now is like there was so much movement be like post COVID and then for the following year. And we had such an aggressive shift. And then we've got all of these people locked into two and a half to three and a half percent interest rates. It's just creating market lockup. And so they'll only move if they have to, even if they're sitting on all of this equity, because now their mortgage payment is going to be double. And it's just, it's that, it's this interesting dichotomy of, okay, I know I've got all this money. I know I can move up, but I don't know that I really like what I see on the market. And I don't know that I love the interest rate. So I think that what I will tell you as far as the Atlanta market is concerned, it's very resilient. Our in-town market is very resilient. It was resilient in 2009, 2010. I mean, whereas some of our um, out of out of perimeter markets, I mean, they were they were decimated. They're up to 40 percent reduction in value. In town was around 18 to 22. So about half of what you saw outside of the perimeter. Um, although I will say since COVID, now we've got all of these markets that have exploded outside of the perimeter, like Roswell's and Alpharetta's and that sort of thing. And so I don't know that, that they're going to see this, the, 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 any kind of real significant contraction until we fix our inventory issue. You know, Atlanta is net positive on its populace every single year. So we grow. The city grows. Uh, we've got a lot. Of, we attract a lot of new business. We're big in the movie industry. Um, so I think that Atlanta is still considered it in its infancy as far as the market is concerned. We are so affordable um, in comparison to a lot of the other markets around the country. Um, and I think that that makes it a, a, a very attractive. The other thing that we're seeing, which I think is a positive, is we have this mass exodus and movement down to Florida. Not everyone loves Florida. So we're getting a lot of bounce back from, from the Floridian market saying, well, that's my next big metro. I think I can live here. I get my four seasons. I like the architecture. There's enough history. You know what? They do have good shopping. They do have good restaurants. Maybe we can live here for a minute. So we are seeing a little bit of that. But I, 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 barring a, a national market contraction, I think Atlanta will flatline in the short term. And then I think it will be, which is a good thing. It'll allow wages to catch up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we'll start seeing movement when these rates come down. So in your market, if, I, if I'm a buyer, what opportunities exist in the market right now? If I'm a buyer. Oh, I think there's I think there's very good opportunity because you have things that are sitting for longer. And I think, you know, we have a lot of new construction and builders want to move that inventory. They don't want to be holding on to it. So they're much more likely to be motivated to take, you know, and we're not talking 10 and 20 percent discounts here. That's not happening. And, and it would it wouldn't be necessary to do that. You know, when you start talking those numbers, the builder can afford to hold it for in a very, very long period of time. But if you're looking to get, you know, an advantage ahead of what I think will be the running of the bulls, and it'll be the running of the bulls when interest rates hit five. When hit, they hit five, there's so many people on the sidelines. So if you can get a three to 5% discount on a $2 million home right now, I think that is a tremendous advantage. And I think they those opportunities exist. But there are also inventory that comes to market and there's still seven buyers for it if it's in the right location, right condition, right price. So it's, you know, you've just got to be looking for what is sitting for a minute. Why is that that seller still living in 2021, 2022, and it's now 2024? Um, because my friend down the street got that price. That doesn't exist. I think sellers have a hard time understanding the impact of where rates really uh, take a more monthly mortgage payment, you know, unless they're currently shopping for it. So I think there is definitely opportunity. There's not a lot of investor opportunity right now. There's real, I mean, our multifamily and investment property market just because of rates is, is really not in a great place. So 
you know, I think it's just looking at inventory that sits and can you get a better deal now? Yep. And then on the flip side, if you're a owner of a property, a potential seller, what opportunities exist in today's market? Well, I, I think that if you, you know, I, I like to talk to some of my folks, if they're willing to put themselves into a temporary position right now, they can take a lot of money off the table, a lot of money that they have acquired in the last 36, 48 months. And I mean, in some instances, we're talking millions of dollars. Um, that's how much things have moved in some of our marketplaces. So they, they could certainly take advantage of that. But, you know, any seller going to market, if they're smart, they price it correctly. They condition it correctly. It's going to sell. It is definitely going to sell. It is still, even though we have these challenges, you know, we're still considered a seller's market. We are still way under three months of inventory. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, what does your business look like today? Are you working more with buyers, with sellers? Do you run a team? I do. Uh, so in the middle of COVID, I was getting a little disenamored with some of the things that were going on and around the city. I think I was getting a little disenamored with, with the business as a whole. You know, when I got in in 09, I sprinted and because I'd come from this place um, where where my back was against the wall, I really kept my foot on the accelerator for, for a decade. And I was starting to get a little tired and fatigued. And I was really just sort of questioning you know, how excited I was about real estate at that point in my career. And so I took a step back and I really just stripped my business down. And I said, if we're going to keep doing this, let's do the things that we enjoy. And what do we enjoy? And so my business had grown to a point where I did have a team. There was 13 of us. And I really like, obviously, <laughs> it, it don't mean for this to sound cliche at all, but I really enjoy the luxury end of the market. I enjoy that. That is that is my speed. Those are my sellers. Those are the types of product I want to, to be in and to market and to sell. And so luxury end of the market was something I was very excited about. And then also I do a lot of new construction development. And that's something, so taking land and titling it and then selling, selling the parcels off or developing the parcels and building single family homes. So what I did was I decided to... Um, uh, promote from within and I brought a sales director in that sales director Brian um, he runs the the team um, under our Brown Daniel uh, group he is responsible for the resale division and then the training and recruitment um, of of all of our agents and then I have underneath there also a new construction we're a big tear down city so then I've got a new construction division that's run by a gentleman by the name of Aziz. Then we have a new development, which I still continue to oversee. Um, and then during that period of time, I set up a tertiary or secondary brand uh, that was standalone specifically for luxury. Because what happened is we were starting to see four and five million dollar listings alongside two hundred and fifty thousand dollar townhouses. And there was some dilution for that product and for that client. So we now have a luxury division, a new construction, new development, and resale division. That's how we're structured. Okay. It's very similar to what we operate in our business. We have sales directors, managers of the resale business, you know, taking care of our agents on that side, new developments, construction, separate group of people, agents, director, and it's... Uh, and then someone else in charge of recruiting and onboarding. It's, uh, it's interesting to see and hear other people like myself in other marketplaces doing similar things. Yeah. Is that something that you organically grew or was it very intentional at a certain time in your career where you said, this is what I'm doing, you mapped it out and you started executing? You know, that's a good question. So I, I would say I think it's a combination of both. It got to, I think we would say it, the impetus got us organically because I fell into new construction very early on in my career. Back in 2010 was my first new construction home. And I was like, I like this. I really like the building and construction and learning it and 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 taking a, a raw lot and, and putting a home on it. And then, of course, I started investing in that. But then with the builders I had those early relationships with, my business continued to grow. And as those builders grow, now we're starting to talk about developments. And so I'm looking at this going, you know, at first I'm like, I can do it all. I can do it all. I will be able to just handle everything. And I'm like, well, how are you going to sit on site and still run your business? Like, that's not going to happen. So it took me a minute to really digest that I had to 
to give up and relinquish some control and obviously some money um, with regard to commissions in order for me to not lose 100% of that business. Um, so that's when really I started formulating the team. I wanted to still be able to have the development business, but not give up my luxury division and, 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 and all of that. So I think it was it was organic to get to that point. And actually, I was in another brokerage in the city, and that brokerage was not at all uh, pro team. They didn't want team. So one of the biggest reasons I moved to Compass uh, five and a half years ago was because they were very pro team and they support that and looked for that. And I think that was a that was a big, big, big part of my decision in moving over to Compass. I'm very happy here for many other reasons now, but I think that was initially very attractive to me. You know, last week I had Kevin Sneeden on a oh, podcast. Oh. Yes. And I, I, I know you're part of the private client network that he's That's started. correct. And what has that done in terms of your business? being a part of that. You know, what it's done for me is given me confidence and safety um, with regard to sending business to 70 of the top luxury markets within the United States. The other thing that it's done, which I really leverage, I don't think everyone in the network leverages this, but I do, is it makes me look bigger than Atlanta. Okay, it makes me look like my 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 colleagues are bigger. And I never got that at any of the other brokerages. I never felt the sense. Compass, the way in which they operate the business and 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 the the, the family of agents is different to anything I've been involved in. And it's, you know, we have been very fortunate, like every other brokerage, we do have, you know, we don't have all of the best agents, but we've been very fortunate to land a lot of really good agents. And, you know, for me, you know, I expanded my business this year into two other markets, one Lake Oconee, which is a big feeder market outside of Atlanta, and then 30A, which is a big beach market. And that gave me the confidence in order to expand and gain partnerships in those markets because of how Compass owns and operates and how supportive they are of it. So it's just, you know, it's really not, we're, get, we're getting the... Um, we're getting ready to go to an event with the top 100 agents of Compass in Napa and Sonoma next week. But we were in Charlotte with private client. And so here I am with all of these big hitters. You know, these guys are selling 30, 40, 50 million dollar houses. And I'm inside of that group. And what Kevin has done is really smart. You know, he's, he's, he's recruiting one agent in each of those markets. He's not diluting it. And so, you know, you, 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 you interview and you bring excellence to that group or you don't stay in that group. So I've really enjoyed it. And I've done a lot of referral business, both inbound and outbound with that group and with Compass, more than I ever did in my career before. Wow, that's a great validation. I was intrigued by, in his office, when we were recording on the back of his wall, there's a, uh, there's a framed picture of all of your faces, and it says $8 billion. And, I, and he explained to me that that was, I think, in 2022, yeah, um, yeah. What all yeah. collectively sold in real estate just that one year. So kudos yeah, to, we put, to Kevin. We put that ad into the Wall Street Journal every year, and there's a lot of people who don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fantastic. And coming close to me here in, in Mexico, um, it was surprising to hear that you have a connection to Mexico, actually. Not in Cabo, but in San Miguel de Allende. Yeah, so that's a that's a that's another interesting uh, thing that's happening in our world right now. Having conversations with, I won't say the name, but a, an international brand partner. Actually, we we are carrying the conversation forward um, about the opportunity of opening up another office in another market, and we're very close to reaching a marketing agreement on that. Uh, we have full support of Compass on it, although Compass have no designs to go international at this point. I think they will in the future. I think you'll see them in the UK. I think you'll see them in Mexico. I think you'll see them in markets like Dubai and possibly Paris, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that isn't on the cards, but they have been exceptionally supportive and have aligned us with some of their marketing partners that do carry international branding. I'm sure you can figure that out, but I won't say what it, who it is on this on this podcast. And um, we are we are excited about the opportunity. You know, that's a really, really interesting place. 
Um, I think you know uh, you know a lot more about it probably than I do, but the World Heritage and just it's just a super cool town. And the sh- what I really like about it is that they run their real estate business very similar to how it's done in the United States, right? They have exclusive listings. There is a commission structure. Um, they don't quite have an MLS yet, but they're they're working toward that. And so it's not like the wild wild west, which I know you are in a lot of markets now in Mexico, and some of those markets are just I mean I can't I. Crazy. Um, So I like that there is some structure. I like the real estate down there. I love the location. I love the town. I love how it's set up. I I mean, there's 170 restaurants. I mean, you can go there for the next 10 years and you're not going to hit all of those restaurants. And it's a direct three and a half hour flight from Atlanta into the airport and then a 40 minute journey. So super convenient. And as I get older and longer in the tooth, you know, it's like it's about trying to expand horizon. So we're very excited to uh, to see if we can create opportunity there for sure. Fantastic. And the last question I have for you, Nicholas, and thank you again for your time. You've been very generous. Um, where do you see your business in five to 10 years? I see that I think there will be a continuation with regard to development. Um, I think I will always continue to be involved in real estate investing. I hope, I I am not certain, but I hope by five years from now, I might be more in a managerial role position and not necessarily out there hunting and killing as much as I have to at this point. You know, for the team, I'm probably generating about 70% of that revenue. And, yeah. and, you know, again, it's just it's now taking back and looking, being being patient enough to try and sort of look at the chessboard, move the pieces, remain involved, get the right people, hire the right people, have people in the best possible positions and then own and operate in multiple markets. And I think uh, that would be very exciting for me to spend a little time at the lake, a little time at the beach and, you know, a little time in the city, a little da- down in Mexico and, and just see how we can bring all of those together. That's where I'd like to be in five years. Well, I'm excited to see you on that journey and I look forward to staying in touch with you, Nicholas. Your market has a direct feeder market into not only San Miguel de Allende, but here in Los Cabos. And I hope to meet you in person sometime soon. Yeah, I'd love to, absolutely, yes. And thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for inviting me to do this. All right, have a good day, take care. All right, take care, bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nick Fong Podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Ronaval Real Estate. And follow Nick on Instagram at Nick Fong underscore Ronaval. Ready to find your Baja dream home? Check out the latest property listings at Ronaval.com or findmexicohouses.com. Hasta luego.